We just talked about the reasons why a market might be a monopoly. One important example is the case of natural monopolies. In some industries, the fixed costs are really, really high, but the marginal cost is low. In this case, a firm that's already established will be able to produce at a lower average cost than any competitor who tries to enter the market. But this isn't the whole story. A firm can have a monopoly, but might still not have that much market power. How can that be? Consider a market where there are some fixed costs, but they're not very large. In such a market, a firm could come in as a monopolist to make a small profit. So long as this monopolist keeps the price not too far above marginal cost, there'll be no more entry into this market because others won't be able to afford the fixed costs. But suppose now that the monopolist raised her price a lot higher than marginal cost, trying to exercise her market power to make a lot more profit. Well, if price goes high enough, then new entrants could cover their fixed costs when they enter. So they'll jump in, ending the monopoly. So even though she's got a monopoly, she has to act sort of like competitive firm because the threat of entry will be enough to keep her price close to marginal cost. We call these types of markets contestable markets. Markets where there isn't competition, but where there is the threat of competition. One famous application of this concept was in the area of airlines. Until the late 1970s, airlines were a private but regulated industry. The government dictated who could fly where and at what price. Why did the government regulate? because they thought the airlines were a natural monopoly. After all, think about how much it costs to buy airplanes. Fixed costs don't get much bigger. So the government stepped in. It identified what it thought was a natural monopoly and told each airline the price it could charge and where and when it could fly. But economists disagreed. They viewed airlines as a good example of a contestable market. Economists predicted the new airline could always start up by buying some old planes and then they'd see their business take off. Economists therefore predicted that if the government just stopped regulating the industry, we'd see prices go down because even though the industry was a natural monopoly, it was a contestable market. Economists carried the day and the U.S. ended regulation or deregulated in the late 1970s. What happened next? Prices did come way down. In 1979, the average domestic flight cost roughly $600. Ten years later, the average price fell to $500. Today, it's closer to $300. The reason is because new airlines entered and competed on price, like Southwest in the early 1970s and JetBlue in 2000. As a result, a flight today between New York and LA costs one third of what it cost in 1974. Another result of the deregulation is that more routes were offered. Now, even some small cities were served. Routes between Yakima, Washington and Portland, Oregon now exist where they didn't before. But there was one more effect that might be surprising. Airline service got crummier. In the 1970s, a typical flight had free meals, free drinks, alcoholic and non, free movies, free check bags, and so on. Today, none of those things are free. Why did it happen? Well, before deregulation, if you're one of the few major air carriers and you wanted to get more customers, what could you do? You couldn't lower prices because the government stopped you. You couldn't add new routes, again, because of the government. What you could do was to offer a really fancy experience. In addition to all the freebies mentioned above, airlines offered cloth napkins and utensils with real silver. Taken from an old guy, flying used to be really nice. This shows how competition is wonderful and sneaky. If you don't let airlines compete on prices, they'll find other ways to attract customers from each other. But this is wasteful. Customers would rather just pay less than have a cloth napkin for a few hours. And if some customers really want this fancy stuff, you can just charge them for it individually. Now airlines can just charge less, so this stopped the wasteful quality competition. The result is a really nice story. In 1965, fewer than one in five Americans had ever flown in a plane. By 2000, one in two Americans takes a flight every single year. The total number of airplane passengers had tripled since the 1970s. Lower prices have made air travel a reality for many Americans. Airlines aren't the only example of contestable markets. There's another monopoly that's arguably contestable as well that you may encounter a lot, Facebook. Facebook is the dominant social networking site. Each month it has 1.71 billion active users. Facebook does not have a natural monopoly in traditional sense. There are not huge fixed monetary costs to setting up a social networking site. But it has a virtual monopoly 
arising from the fact that everyone uses Facebook. Your friends are on Facebook and that makes Facebook more valuable to you. If a new social network site starts up, unless all your friends are on it, you're not all that interested in signing up yourself. And since you aren't on it, your friends aren't all that interested in signing up either. So to start a social network site that can compete with Facebook, you need to somehow get millions or even billions of users. This is a huge fixed cost and therefore a barrier to entry. But this barrier isn't insurmountable. In fact, competing social networks pop up a lot, from Instagram to Snapchat to Tumblr. So we're not that worried about Facebook's monopoly status because it appears to be easy to contest. In fact, one of Facebook's slogans is, it's free and always will be. As much of an advantage as Facebook has, it would probably lose a huge amount of users if it started charging a price. So like airlines, it turns out that social networking sites too are a contestable market. This is great for you, since it means most of the apps on your phone continue to be free. From an economics perspective, it also shows us that being a monopolist doesn't mean you get to do whatever you want. What's good for you as a customer is exactly what limits Facebook's ability to charge a higher price.